Right. So, Will Bates, you are the composer of Hulu's The Looming Tower, which is a brand new 10 part uh, limited series that examines the lead up to 9 11. It's based on a Pulitzer Prize winning nonfiction book by Lawrence Wright. Uh, this being such a, a huge subject to tackle for a television series, I wonder what your initial expectations for it were like and how that affected your uh, decisions for creating the score. Absolutely. Well, um, I guess the first thing that I did was read Lawrence's book, which is just such an extraordinarily in-depth, I don't know if you've read it, but I have, yes. the detail is extraordinary. I met him at the premiere for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and I was like a child. I was so excited to meet him. He's like, I, I'm, he's like my hero, that guy. Um, but yeah, I, I guess for me, the expectation was, you know, having read it, just knowing how vastly, how huge this subject is, obviously, and, you know, something that to some extent all of us have lived through and, um, you know, understanding, you know, in a very basic sense, the, I guess the first thing that really struck me musically was the geographical aspect of it. You know, I would, I was having to kind of figure out different instrumentation and different kind of tonalities for all the various locations. And I think one of my first conversations with Danny, the showrunner, I think they were, maybe they were in South Africa. I can't remember, but they were, they were like already just going all over the world doing all this, all of this shooting. And it just seems kind of clear that of all the things that I've worked on, this is probably going to be the, the, the largest in terms of the, the, the scope of work and the level of detail that it really needed. You mentioned the uh, geographical uh, aspects of this, and it does go all over the globe. Um, can you talk a bit more about how that influenced your music, how you were able to uh, convey these different locales? Sure. I guess, you know, the, the first and most obvious way to do that is to source certain instrumentation. And funnily enough, I got the job when I was on holiday in Ibiza. Um, my family have a house there and whatnot, so I, I go there with my family quite a lot. Um, and there's a guy on the island that um, I found that sells a bunch of like Middle Eastern stuff. So I bought like a Turkish name from him and uh, Lira and various other things. And generally when I start most projects, I tend to try and source some kind of unique sound or some kind of instrument that would be unique to that project. So this was a really good opportunity to do that. So I guess that was the first thing I did was just like, get a whole bunch of stuff from this dude and bring it back to LA and just start kind of messing around with stuff. And I feel like I've made a career out of being able to pick up instruments and play them not particularly well, but like certainly well enough to come up with melodies and that kind of thing. So that was really the first thing. And then I, I did a little bit of research into certain scales, like Middle Eastern scales. And for some of the characters, you know, one of the things that really struck me about Lawrence's book and was also really important with the with the series is that it's not, it tries not to be a simple case of kind of goodies and baddies, you know, like you're, you're definitely trying to sort of understand more about why certain things were, ha were happening and, you know, why people were making certain decisions. So it was important that the when it went to the Middle East or when a certain character is kind of being described musically, it shouldn't just be kind of, you know, baddie music. So I feel like in order to kind of get away from that, I, I had to sort of understand a little bit more about where these characters were coming from and what kind of scales would be appropriate and trying to emote more rather than just being kind of straightforward, you know, obviously descriptive. It's interesting you say that. I wanted to ask um, because, you know, the book is obviously a, a work of nonfiction and it presents the facts and the show does a very good job of doing that as well. Um, but it also um, functions as a, I don't want to say as an entertainment, but there is a, obviously a thriller aspect to it. You know, you, you're, you're watching it and it's very suspenseful at times. So I wonder how uh, you went about trying to find the right balance for that, of not, I guess, cheapening the material too much or going too overboard in the sort of um, more entertaining aspects of yeah, this. No, I get it. I, you know, I think in the end, that was probably the most challenging part of the process for me. And in a way, it was something that we had to kind of discover together once we were really working. You know, I, I feel like some of the themes and the, the larger, you know, like O'Neill's theme or the themes for certain 
geographical locations were were easier to come up with right at the beginning and we all kind of like agreed on certain tonalities but then finding the rhythm and the the energy for certain scenes was the part where we really had to kind of go backwards and forwards and really discover how far we could push it or or rein it in and i think in the end we 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 got on a really good kind of sometimes it's quite restrained and sometimes you're right it's like full on you know it's it's a suspenseful sometimes exciting you know story and it's it, having to kind of convey that musically was 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 tricky and that was the that was probably the most challenging part of all of it and getting that like the the friction between the FBI and the CIA I feel like that was the once we kind of cracked that one it was the other stuff tended to kind of fall into place because I feel like that's where a lot of the tension comes from it's also of course wildly ambitious in terms of its length um, now of course you, you you are a TV vet you also come from the world of film as well um, this being a, a, a very contained 10 part story, uh, I wonder if your approach to it was different from the way that you approach, say, your work on The Path. Um, did it, this being a self contained story, did that affect it at all? Um, to some extent, it did, yeah, because obviously we all know where this is heading. And that was something that was always, forgive the pun, but it was always kind of looming, you know, like knowing how are we going to approach that final episode? Um, I don't want to, I don't know how far, what are we on, like episode four right now? Um, four or five, yes. But uh, without kind of giving too much away, it's, it, it, there's a lot to to kind of build up to. So yes, definitely, it kind of, it, it really changed the way that I approach certain things and knowing what happens to certain characters and the the intensity of, the tragedies and how that affects melody is has been was pretty interesting to me and i it was almost like pretty daunting to know how to treat certain things in the final few episodes and it was always like on in the back of my mind whereas a show like the path i feel like we're it's open ended in a sense isn't it so it's easier to you know to kind of change the context of a melody and and have it revert back to something in the next episode, whereas everything is very kind of forward moving in the Looming Tower. You're kind of moving towards this final event. So um, that definitely affected the way that I approached the writing. You mentioned Dan Fellerman uh, earlier, the showrunner, a uh, two-time Oscar-nominated writer uh, who uh, adapted this for television. Can you talk a bit more about what that collaboration was like between the two of you? Um, yeah, it was very, you know, we had a very strong kind of day-to-day -day connection and, you know, it was, we we worked a little bit on the pilot and then there was a bit of a break and then we kind of moved really fast into, you know, a week by week. One thing about working on these Hulu shows is it tends to just be, you know, they'll order the whole season. So we really had, we had to kind of come up with the whole vision all in one go, if that makes sense, but then obviously get kind of the detail of the the week to week episodes really straightened out but you know he he and I went backwards and forwards a lot and I, I was in New York quite a bit I tend to kind of split my time between New York and LA um the post for this one happened in New York so I tried to be there as much as possible and try and be in the room with him when we can kind of talk about big ideas and whatnot and be at the mixes and stuff but he was he's awesome and he he came up with a lot of really interesting stuff that I don't think I ever would have thought of you know like removing a piano note like some some really detailed stuff that i've not really known a showrunner to have that kind of focus as much as this and it was kind of amazing and i learned a lot from it like really i learned a lot about restraint i think actually from him so it was really great and did you work at all with uh, alex gibney uh, one of the other creators who directed the pilot right, right at the very very beginning but yeah generally you know as as tends to be the case with these things the once the pilot is directed the pilot the director tends to kind of move on um and you know i alex and i of course he's a producer so we we stayed in touch throughout the process in fact i was doing another show of his at the same time called dirty money um that was going on during the looming tower so we were kind of like in contact about that one so it was, it was kind of a funny moment where i'm doing vw and bin laden you know right in the same, in the same week um, all right uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you've been kind of busy this year uh, with some other projects as well. Uh, you had the first season of the show Rise. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that show and about uh, your work on it? 
Um, sure. So that's another show that I've done with Jason Katim. So this is the third show that we've done together. Um, also another one that Mike Cahill directed the pilot of. Um, and that one, I mean, talk about kind of a different role of music. That's been a very, that was almost like my sorbet after the kind of intense stress of, you know, looming tower tension. Um, Rise has been very much about, you know, feeling in the heart and it's been, uh, I, I've loved it. It's been so interesting to kind of have that musical aspect of the show as well and how that kind of is incorporated into the score. Um, so yeah, that, in a way I've, I've, it's been a very interesting year. I've had a lot of like balancing of uh, different emotions and the different roles that music can play in, in these shows. And you mentioned uh, Dirty Money from Alex Gibney, uh, which is a documentary series. Uh, can you talk a bit about your work on that show? I mean, does it uh, does it change at all going from, uh, well, uh, fiction or nonfiction adaptation into something that is strictly nonfiction? Um, I, you know, I, I suppose it does to, in some respects, but one thing about Alex is his, movie, his shows are very, his, and his movies are very cinematic, and I feel like it, the role that music plays is it's somehow cinematic and narrative driven. So I tend to, as he kind of would say, I think as well, I tend to try and keep that approach. The the sort of narrative driven music is sort of the same for, for each project. I mean, that one was nuts. The, uh, that, there was tons of like craft work and, and sort of weird German like techno meets kind of Pharaoh Saunders. It was a, uh, this is really fun, actually, out, out of my more recent ones, that's been the kind of weirder one. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, that was very, very weird, <laughs> doing like Rise, Looming Tower, and Dirty Money all at the same time, pretty much. And you also had the uh, third season of The Path, and I believe the third season of The Magicians as well. Yep. Um, so how has your work evolved on those shows? over the years? Does it get easier uh, with time when you're working on a show over a certain number of years? Um, I guess it does. I mean, I still, it's important to me to make sure that everything is still kind of moving forward and changing, but there's definitely, you know, it's with the path, for example, it's been great to kind of have those melodies and like really like, so now Eddie is in charge of the movement. How can we kind of change the instrumentation? And that was like part of my challenge with that show. and and to some extent with the magicians as well i feel like with the magicians it's more about like the stakes are so much higher for every season so i feel like that one just kind of gets bigger in its scope of of orchestration and in terms of the sounds and that kind of thing um but yeah you know i having having the resources of those melodies in place allows me to kind of really experiment with the palette with both of those shows so it is kind of fun it's um it's a different part of the brain on this like having it's like an sometimes it's like a reorchestrating skill that comes into play and then of course there are new melodies and whatnot as well but yeah it's fun like i mentioned before you uh come from the world of film and uh you're doing a lot of tv lately in addition to all of your film work um i mean we've seen in the last few years that uh television's been getting better uh, in terms of quality and writing and acting and directing and all that? Has it gotten better for composers as well? I think so. I think just generally the the standard of work is, you know, exceptional. I feel like the the world of, of TV film scoring used to be kind of a lesser version of, of cinema, and I feel very much now that they're, they're equals. Um, I was just watching a show called Babylon Berlin, and if you're familiar with that, and the score to oh, that, yeah, the was, Tom Twyker thing. So. Yeah, it's phenomenal, yeah. and just like it's amazing that I don't think that a score like that would have existed a few years ago. Like that just seems it's very experimental and and very ambitious, and um, yeah, I I think for sure it's definitely the standard across the board is just kind of it's so impossibly high right now. Well, uh, Will Bates, I see that I'm talking to you from your studio, so I assume you're going to go right back to work after this. Um, <laughs> uh, pleasure talking with you again. Thank you so much, and congratulations on the Lumi Tower and uh, all your work this year. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye.